So uh, today, uh, we, like I said, we have our, our, our last speaker series for this year. We'll be restarting up in September as you all are coming back. Any seniors? Any, anybody graduating? Who graduated? Stand up. Anybody else graduate? That's right. That's right. Made it through, almost. I know you got a couple more tests to take, probably. One more, all right. So, uh, you know, you're all going to get there soon. So uh, we want to continue to support you. Make sure we communicate and know uh, what your needs are as you progress through. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to delay anymore, because afterwards we're going to have uh, uh, our, our, our lunch and or we'll have some something for you out there. So we're gonna I'm gonna yield the remaining time that I have to our guest speaker. Uh, this is uh, Nars Thomas. He comes out of uh, Phoenix, Arizona, right now. And uh, so without further ado, Nars. No, 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 I'm, I'm good here. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I've been waiting for this. Everybody get on your feet. Get on your feet. Get on your feet. Get on your feet. Get with me now. Get with me. Get with me now. Get with me. Now watch this. Give yourself three. Give yourself three. Give yourself three. Give yourself two. Give yourself two. Give yourself one. Give yourself three. Give yourself two. Give yourself three. Give yourself one. 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 Somebody scream! <laughs> I told you, we're going to send you out with a bang. Going to send you out with a bang. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what I tell everybody else. And we start every presentation the same way. And I'm going to encourage you to do one thing. Make a decision. Make a decision. Make a decision. There's a lot of choices, but I need you to make a decision. If you want to be successful, your success begins with a decision. Period. The end. Now, when I was seven years old, seven or eight years old, first year I ever played, uh, ever wanted to play football, I made a decision. A decision that actually changed my life in a lot of ways because that decision governed every decision that I made along the way until I had an opportunity to, to actually play professional football. I wanted to play pro football, but along the way there were some challenges and there were some difficulties. Just like the decision when you decided, young man, four years ago you came on this campus and you probably have come against some obstacles or so some things that just, wait a minute, I don't even know if this is for me. I don't know for sure if this is what I'm meant to be doing. But I made a decision. And along the way, once that decision was made, I had some choices. And in those obstacles, those choices became even more critical to the success and the ultimate goal of sitting in front of, what, 75,000 fans at Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati in a New York Giants football uniform, 70,000 fans. It was pretty awesome. Problem was, those 70,000 fans that was cheering, those were Cincinnati Bengal fans. I was with the New York Giants at the time, and they were cheering because I had just given up the biggest play of the night. And the team, they actually ended up, we actually won the game, but I gave up the biggest play of the night. And everybody, it was crazy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on the field, I'm looking across the field and I got this long walk and on the other side of the field is Dan Reeves, the head coach at the time. And I had to walk and he could see me and he walked right up to me and says, I thought that you were in coverage. I thought you had the right coverage. I said, I did. He says, no, you didn't. And just like that, that football dream was over. But I made a decision at a young age to make that happen. Now, everybody in here doesn't have that same football dream. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your individual gift, your individual goals, things that you have set in your life that you want to have happen. The biggest thing behind that decision of wanting to play professional football was not about the fame, wasn't about the money. It was what was really driving me at the core of everything 
that drove me to want to be a professional athlete. It was one thing. I got this crazy idea as an eight-year-old living in Dothan, Alabama. Anybody from Dothan? Do we got anybody from Dothan? Northview? Dothan High? Okay. I had this crazy hair. How many, I mean, how many of you have been six years old? How many of you have been seven? You had these, this harebrained idea. This was my harebrained idea. I thought, hey, you know what? What if I made it to the NFL and I had a big game and I got on national television and I could call out to my dad and he would see me playing? Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, like, that's a little bit more, <laughs> that's a little bit more far-fetched than just saying, hey, you know what, I want to be a fireman, or I want to be a doctor, or I want to be a police officer. That's a lot to subject yourself to, to say, okay, this is what I want to do, but this is what we're talking about, Dr. Glenn is talking about. What are you motivated to do? What is it that motivates you to do what you're trying to do, to get to the finish line? There's got to be something that motivates you, that drives you. Now, I love the game of football. I just looked at it like, okay, I love this. I love playing. In fact, I loved it so much. I remember the first time I played in a game, I didn't even get to play. <laughs> I was on the bench. I fell in love with football on the last play of a football game that we lost. I was playing a little team. Oh, I'm going to say this anyway. We were playing a team called the Volunteers. And the volunteers, I've played for a team called the Superfood Redskins. They still have superfoods in Alabama? So Superfoods was our sponsor. It's the last play of the game. We needed to stop them on the goal line. I was sitting on the bench. But what I fell in love with that night was the effort in the collision. So the ball snaps and it's a big boom. And I'm like, this is for me. I, walk, I came home that night. Now, <laughs> this is crazy. This is, and this is what and this is probably how you did. Your, your parents probably encouraged you and so on. I went home that night. I was just beaming. Didn't even play that much. I mean, I got my minimal plays. I think you had to play eight plays. I got my eight. They probably, it was probably seven and a half because I really wasn't even that good. I wasn't that big and so on. I get home. I'm sitting on the counter, still in my uniform, except for my helmet. Pants just as white as they were when I left the house. I didn't even, in fact... <laughs> That first game, I didn't even have my pads in right. I didn't even have my knee pads. I had my knee pads up under my thigh pads. Anybody play before you? So I had my tail pads and everything, but I didn't have my knee pads. It didn't matter because I wasn't out there long enough to get dirty anyway. But I sat on that, in that kitchen counter that night, and I told my mom, I says, Mama, I want to play pro football. And she looked at me, she looked like, me like I was crazy, but she looked at me and said, you know what, if you work hard, that can happen for you. So that night, I made a decision. Eight years old, third grade. My challenge to you today, if I can do that at eight, think about you now, being mature. You've lived some life. You've got some type of direction. If you didn't have a direction, people without direction, they don't get to come and sit in here. They don't. So you've already made one valuable decision that I want to get a college degree, that I want to graduate from college. I want to get an education. I want to get a good job. So you've already made a decision. Out of all of the choices out there, you chose Alabama a and Where are my Bulldogs at? Bulldogs, all right, OK. I thought I was made. I wanted to bark with you. I don't know. I don't want to. If I bark too hard, it might blow out the mic. But you made a decision. You had a lot of choices. You made a decision to come here, Alabama a and And now you're a Bulldog. And soon some of you will be graduates. But I made a choice. I made a decision out of so many choices of things that I wanted to pursue. But I also knew why. Crazy. That's crazy. Is that, sound, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? Like, but that's what we are. We're little kids with all of these things and all of these thoughts in our heads of what we could possibly become. You know, we dream big. And for some reason, at some point in life, things come, up, come about that happen to you. And it can actually choke that very dream, that very purpose out of you. We're here to make sure that that dream is never choked out of you. Don't let the maturity, don't let the circumstances of in the final exam tomorrow or next week or next semester when you come back, choke out the dream that you have for yourself to be successful here on this campus or, what, or whatever it is that you want to do in life. Well, like I told you before, you know, long before 
I got, got a chance to suit up and, and be in front of those 75,000 people in Cincinnati, there was obstacles that came along the way. So that was at age eight. Five years later, five years later, we moved away from Dothan and moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was in a bad situation relationship-wise, and so my mom packed up my brothers and I, and we moved away. We left Dothan, went to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and within a week, within a week, we moved there right after Thanksgiving of 1982. And within a week after being there, this family that we were living with, we ended up in a homeless shelter. And I'm going to share this with you because I want you to understand the importance of not a choice, but how convicted are you about the decision that you're going to make about what it is that you want to accomplish in this life? How convicted, how are, you, how, are you, how are you really locked in and that you're not, there's nothing that's going to come about that will shake you. So we had been there about a couple of weeks, right after Thanksgiving. It is now December 7, 1982. Anybody, what's synonymous with December 7th? Anybody know? December 7, 1941 is Pearl Harbor. December 7, 1982, 41 years later to the day, I had my own Pearl Harbor. I walked in from school and my mom was sitting in the bedroom and she was crying, tears flowing down her face. And I said, what's wrong, mom? She says, this lady wants us to move out. I didn't understand. The lady in the, in, that we were staying with, she's ranting and raving, I didn't do nothing to your mama, I didn't do anything, I didn't do anything, don't hurt me, didn't this? I'm like, I didn't understand, what are you talking about? My mom pulled, me, pulled us into the bedroom and she said, she, we have to leave. We have to leave this place. I says, I don't get it, Ma. I don't understand. Why, why, are we, why do we have to do this? Because understand this. We left with the idea that we were going to stay with this family for a better part of two, three years before we could actually get on our feet. And here we are within a week, two weeks later, and now we're being asked to leave. And I didn't understand. So my mom pulled us in the bedroom, and she sat us on the bed and, and told us about the events of that day. She got a job working with the lady that we were living with, the cleaning hotel rooms. They were cleaning hotel rooms. And my mom actually was, had, you know, for those first couple of weeks, it already started going. We had, we had gotten to a nice routine. I was getting used to going to my school. Oh my God. <laughs> you guys remember Joe Clark from like Lean On Me? I lived it. <laughs> it was, but Joe Clark wasn't there. This was like a free for all. I like, I had never seen anything like this in a public school in my life. Moving from the south to the inner city of Milwaukee, crazy. I had never seen anything like it. Don't try it. <laughs> Actually, I don't know how much better it is now. But I can tell you this. It was a shock. It was a shock to everything that we had, what we were used to back in Dothan. My mom sat there and explained to us, she says, while I was cleaning one of the rooms today, I walked in and I found a woman murdered, cut up, stabbed, devastated, devastated. Here's a woman who, in her right mind, for the right reasons, felt that if she moved her boys and herself out of a bad situation to make it better, two weeks, three weeks into that situation, and we're talking about a pretty it was a comfortable life. We had two cars. We had a nice house. I had my own room, the whole deal. When I walked into this lady's house when we first got there, and it was nothing like what we thought it was supposed to be. Nothing like it. So all of a sudden, this idea of being and leaving and for greener pastures, if you want to call that, or starting over, went from here to there in a matter of a couple of weeks. And now you're being asked to leave. Well, you would think that, okay, so she found someone. So this woman should show some compassion in that situation, but she didn't. She basically said to my mom, you act like you ain't never seen a dead person before. <laughs> you, you ever seen a dead, how many people have seen a murder, found anybody murdered? I don't know, if you have, it's pretty, it will scar you for life. It's pretty devastating under the circumstances. That's just not something routine. Routine is saying, hey, you know what? I was walking across campus and found a quarter by the pond. Now, that's normal. That's a part of a normal day. Finding someone murdered, a woman, stabbed and cut up in a, in a hotel room, that's not normal. 
So the woman was very angry and upset because of the way that everything happened. And, sh and so there's news cameras, there's police taking reports and all of these things. She explained to me her events of the day. Meanwhile, in the other room, this woman is still ranting and raving. And my mom says, you know what, guys, we need to just go ahead and pack up. Let's pack up. And so when we had left Dothan, we had some clothes in suitcases, some things in garbage bags and so on. And here we are. We're packing these clothes, packing up. Everything about to change. You want it unex unexplainable, unexpected. So fortunately, though, fortunately, we ended up uh, getting moved to a homeless shelter. But before that, we didn't really know where we were going. Fortunately, there was a, a television reporter. His name was Bill Taylor from the NBC station in, in Milwaukee. And he saw my mom in shambles at the scene of the crime. He gave her his card and says, here, you need to reach out to this, young, to this man, this house of peace, it was called. And fortunately for me, my early exploits of leaving the small south into the big city, I had already figured out how to take the bus. I had become a savvy city boy. Not. But I knew where the house of peace was because it was on my way to school. It was a yellow house in the middle of the hood that didn't fit in the middle of the hood, but it was there, and it was yellow, so it was really bright, so it did looked like a place of hope, but I didn't know what it was. I just always, I considered it one of my landmarks as I would take the bus every day. I had to learn how to take the city bus everywhere. You know, we couldn't walk, not very safe to do. It's getting cold. So that night we packed all of our things. We left some of our things on the porch. And once we, once we got the porch, got, got our things set on the porch, we took off and went to the House of Peace. We get there and there's paperwork to do and so on and so forth. And, I told my mom, I know where this place is. I just don't, I don't know what, what it is that it do. So of course we don't know where we're going. Now it doesn't snow, I'm sure it snows here, but when Dothan it doesn't snow a lot. That same night, while we're walking to the House of Peace, bags in our hand, the only thing that we have on our back, it starts to snow. And I had this green jacket. I remember this green jacket was puffy, but like the sleeves, we're right here, so like my arms stuck out the sleeves like a pair of legs. I could have walked around like I was a primate. It was, and, and it was cold, and it started snowing. So I forever have had this image in my head, walking across Walnut Street in front of this McDonald's with my family, garbage bags, and suitcase. What do you do in that situation? Do you quit? What are you going to do in that situation? What, how do you, what picture do you paint at that point? I want to graduate from Alabama A&M. I want a college degree. I want, to, I want to be a fireman. I want to do something with my life, but not right now. No picture in the room looks like anything that you want to have happen for you. All of a sudden, all of that is done. It's off the table. That first night in the homeless shelter, I had to make another decision, OK? Remember, I challenged you before, make a decision. You got to make a decision. Make a decision. How powerful was one decision as an eight-year-old in Dothan, Alabama, going to shape everything else from that point? Because before I laid my head on the bed that night in that homeless shelter that they put us in, I said, I guess I'll have to make it from the NFL from here. So again, lots of choices. Milwaukee at the time, and even now, very dangerous place. But even then, there's gangs. There was a lot of things. There's a lot of choices that I could have been a part of. That I could have been, that I could have been in. I knew the guys. I, just being where we were, there was a lot of